Okay, hi everyone and welcome back to Communist Radio. Today I'm joined by Nelson. Nelson is on the executive committee of the RCP and is also a regular writer on Marxist economics, not just economics, art and many other things as well. Uh, Welcome Nelson. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. And today we are talking about the budget. So we're actually recording this before the budget has come out, but we feel pretty confident that there's some predictions or assumptions that we can make in terms of what to expect. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, more of the same. Yes, more of the same. That's the, that's it. That's the podcast. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, but in order for us to look at the budget and understand why it is the way that it is, we think that it would be a good idea to start by zooming out a bit and looking at the state of, of the British economy as a whole and by extension, British capitalism. And in order to do that, we need to go back to 2008, the 2008 financial crash. And and why do I say that? From 2008, what happened has dictated pretty much all economic policy ever since then. This was really a key moment, um, a a turning point uh, from the point of view of of, of world capitalism, but definitely British capitalism. It's a bit beyond the memories of, of some people, but... This was a moment when a lot of the contradictions inherent in the capitalist system started to express itself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, we have to see the context of what's going on today in terms of the world crisis of capitalism and the British crisis of capitalism in the context of 2008. You can even go back further, really, to the the crisis of the 70s in terms of the overall historical period that we're in and what it represents. But yeah, as you said, 2008 was was, uh, a real turning point for uh, for global uh, capitalism you know it was called the sort of um, the financial the great financial crisis the credit crunch but what we would say about 2008 is that it was fundamentally a crisis of overproduction mm-hmm. you know marx explained that the fundamental cause of all capitalist crisis at the end of the day is overproduction there are too many commodities too many goods produced for the world market uh, to absorb now every crisis is of course different right um, and 2008 expressed itself as a financial crisis. Um, but the reason for that um, is that the capitalists, um, in a general sense, you could say that they were trying to avoid the crisis of overproduction by investing in speculation, pumping money into the financial system, because they realized, I, you know, either consciously or unconsciously, that actually it was harder and harder for them to produce commodities and produce goods and invest, uh, you know, in the real economy, so to speak. So from a pure profit making perspective, they just thought, why don't I just put money into finance, into into speculation? Yeah. And so it created this massive bubble in the financial system, which just burst uh, mm-hmm. and triggered the the greatest crisis of capitalism at that point. Yeah, and this is this is interesting because. I mean, I was youngish at the time, and I'm sure you were too. Yeah, but a bit older than you. <laughs> my memories of 2008 are, yeah, Gordon Brown looking a bit distressed on TV. Um, but also, it was just this idea that greed had gone too far. The greedy mm. bankers, and look, there's there's a truth to that clearly. Um, bankers bonuses and this kind of everything had gotten out of control, and they'd gotten a bit drunk and high on their own positions and what they were doing, but you can take that a bit too far and make it all a question of psychology or even individualism in terms of the people who were there, rather than understanding it or the crash itself as a logic of the system, or rather should we say the consequence of trying to cover up or make up for like problems that were being stored up in the in the economy and also in in britain's economy specifically you know when you're talking about this speculation in particular this is that this is a big feature of of british capitalism and explains why because this was a a global crisis but britain in particular fared quite badly (laughs) out of it and struggled to recover at the same pace as some other bigger economies did Mm -hmm. because British capitalism has its own particular um, idiosyncrasies, should we say? Definitely. Yeah. uh, You know, that point about sort of, you know, the greed of individual, you know, bankers and things like that, obviously it played a role. But as Mm -hmm. you say, there's always this attempt to try and individualize the problem, Mm -hmm. which exists 
um, as part of the system as a whole. The reason why the banks operate like that, the reason why um, there was so much greed um, and all of these things was because that is the logic of the capitalist system. If the banks, if whoever it is, you know, even the capitalists producing things, if they don't operate greedily, ruthlessly, they go out of business. They don't make any profits. Um, it's driven by the logic of the system. And, and actually what you said about sort of the specifics of, of, of the British economy in that particular uh, period and what actually happened. 2008, 2008 sorry, had a huge impact uh, on, on everything that followed. If we think about the policies that, that took place afterwards, there was um, a historic period of what we call low uh, interest rates uh, mm -hmm. and cheap credit basically pumped into the economy to keep, um, keep the system alive. They spent um, globally, the capitalist class, uh, billions and billions of dollars uh, propping up businesses and institutions that should have gone bankrupt according to the laws of the market, right? Yeah. Um, they should have uh, gone bust because they weren't making any money and yet they weren't done that. The banks were bailed out in this country and in America uh, as well. And at the same time, how was this paid? It was paid uh, by the working class through austerity. Exactly. You know, we say uh, in all our articles, we've had over 14 years of austerity. And it's true. It started in that particular period um, as a result of the 2008 crisis. You know, I have friends and, and family that were hugely affected by this mm -hmm. in that entire period. Uh, and all of that is set to sort of um, continue now. Yeah, exactly. So since 2008, what's happened? The state has just absorbed all of the debts of the banks and then shifted that burden onto the working class. And we've had austerity ever since then. And we know that the budget that's being announced today is not really going to be any different. And the reason we're pushing this point, I suppose, quite hard is Labour and Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves have gone to a lot of effort to say this is a transformative budget, it's historic, we're putting working people first and so on and so forth. But we know that there will be no diff, like people's lives are gonna continue actually to get worse. The little we do know about the budget has already told us this, right? In terms of the winter fuel allowance, refusing to, to scrap the two child benefit cap, <clears throat> the announcement about um, uh, bus fares, the cap on bus fares going up to, to three pounds. All of this is gonna make life difficult. In fact, we had a report in Falmouth branch last night, they were discussing this where we've got some university students and they were talking about the fact that this, the, the bus fare issue in particular is gonna massively impact students and the budgets that they have. Um, and there is potential for some campaigning around this, which I'm sure the comrades are gonna to continue to discuss. But the point is, despite all of the fanfare around this budget being somehow transformative and historic and in the interests of working people, it's 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 not going to be at all. So um, you look at the situation um, in the British economy. Um, the British economy is a weak rentier economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I mean by that is that actually there was a conscious decision, you know, made by Margaret Thatcher and other people um, to destroy the manufacturing base uh, of this country, destroy the mm -hmm. industry and shift the focus into financial services, into uh, speculation and to things like that. And it's done long-term damage uh, to the economy now. And it's why crises like the 2008 and the COVID crisis are so damaging to the British economy because of this uh, weak base. Um, so in this context, you know, there is no prospect of anything different to than what the Tories have been doing for, uh, from um, from Reeves uh, and, and from Starmer. You know, they're promising no returns to austerity, but you know, you've just mentioned some of the policies that they've actually uh, been implementing. I mean, just an example of this, you know, Reeves has hinted that um, the taxes on businesses are gonna increase, and that includes a national uh, insurance yes. uh, increase in terms of the employer contributions. And what does that actually mean? Because it actually means that um, the, the amount of money that uh, the employer has to pay the government in national insurance increases. And so the total cost uh, of what it costs to hire someone is going to increase. But the employees are not just going to take that. Yeah. What they're going to do is they're going to reduce the amount that is paid to the worker in wages. So that is austerity. That yeah. is an attack on the working class. Uh, and it's also going to potentially result in an increase in prices to make up for the shortfall. Or they're just not going to hire enough people. They're going to reduce their, their headcounts uh, to save themselves money. And, and that just highlights a wider point about the nature of the capitalist economy. It's like what you were saying earlier. It's not just a question of personal greed or, or, or things like that or moral bankruptcy. This is the logic of the system. 
we do not control the economy. The capitalists uh, and the businesses control the economy. And we are, in a way, uh, at their whim uh, yes. in, in terms of um, what happens to us. Yeah, or like, so they're freezing tax thresholds, for example. So mm. even if minimum wage, all these things are going up a little bit, you're still going to end up paying more in taxes. And exactly. so like everything they're doing is just some they're just it's austerity by a different name yeah. um and they're just covering up and trying to use all these tricks because they're still trying to appeal to some kind of labor base and you know we are a labor government in the interest of working people but if you try and patch up the capitalist system in this particular moment especially all you're going to do is end up attacking the working class um and that explains what the budget is no matter no matter how hard they try and they try and change it. Exactly. You know, the state, um, where does it get its money from? It has to get its money either by, you. basically you tax workers, right? Or you tax big business, mm -hmm. right? What's the, what's the choice going to be? What uh, What is this government actually saying to big business? They're bending over backwards mm -hmm. to appease uh, big business. Uh, in fact, if you remember when P&O ferries, um, they sacked, um, I think it was uh, nearly 1,000 workers in 2022 and replaced them with low paid agency staff. Um, Keir Starmer has bent over backwards to keep P&O ferries in Britain. He's saying, no, please don't take your £1 billion <laughs> investment away away from the country. After what they did to yeah. the British workforce, which he is claiming to uh, to represent and look after the interests of. You know, Reeves has said she doesn't want to spook uh, business investments. You know, Starmer has promised to the oligarchs and CEOs he's going to sweep away regulations that sort of... Um, uh, give rights to workers, basically, to make it easier for businesses to invest in. That's what this government represents. Yeah, that, and this brings us on to the other key part of the budget, right, is this idea of investment. And mm. I keep seeing all these statements from Starmer, like, Britain is back, we're we're open for business, please come, come and invest in us. But actually, when you look, it's, which is because capital investment in Britain is really low, right? It's at something like 2.4%. 2.4%, yeah. Um, which is which is quite low, and yeah. so Rachel Reeves is you know made all these statements and like okay we really need to improve this, but if you look at what they're actually trying to do, they're actually just trying to keep it at that level mm -hmm. because I think it was this the because and all of this is is all geared towards you know somehow growing the economy, but there's no real prospects for that in terms of the investment that they're hoping to attract and and implement. It's not really going to happen. They're just trying to keep it at 2.4%. Um, and yeah, the CBI have said that they are expecting, as a result of this budget, in fact, no real growth zero in, the, zero, Literally. in the economy. <laughs> um, and so when you look under the surface of all of the fanfare and rhetoric around it, there's very little there, apart from austerity, as we've already explained. Exactly. You know, again, you know, it, it begs the question, what serious basis is there for an, an, an economic boom, basically, yeah. in the British economy? Uh, there isn't one. Everything that they've promised, you know, for example, the NHS investment promises that they're, they're hinting at in this budget, it is minuscule compared yes. to what is actually needed. Look at the amount of money that we need to repair the damage that has been done by austerity to the NHS to properly fund it, to repair all of the crumbling schools and hospitals uh, and the terrible train service that exists in this uh, in this country with the prices increasing and the, um, the overall service uh, declining. Nothing that this budget offers is going to be able to even dent uh, what is going on uh, there. In fact, as, as we said, the strongest promises they're making basically is, is to big business. Mm. Uh, uh, and to finance capital. In fact, if you look at the issues that you know, we talk about the political side of it, right? What do what do workers care about? What are the what are the issues that um, that they want to see action on? Reeves has been asked, "Will you nationalise Thames Water?" Yeah. Because this is a huge problem uh, for um, uh, for obviously the, the areas where Thames Water covers. We've seen this company literally dump raw sewage onto the streets of many parts of the country. The cost of this is being directly pushed onto the workers. Uh, and they are saying to Reeves, will you nationalize this company? And she's ruled it out completely. Yeah. Um, what does that say again about the interests of this government, where their priorities are, you know, um, and, and what, they, what they exist to do? They have come to power fully intending to rule for big business yeah. uh, and for capitalism. And that means preparing for cuts, privatizations, attacks on working conditions, and it's already started. Yeah. And look, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're communists as well, right? What we're interested in is how all of this will impact consciousness. As you said, I think, at the start, Starmer was already hated when mm. he came to power. 
the first 100 days has been filled with intense social issues, crises, turbulation. Um, and with this budget announcement and then the policies actually being implemented, this is bound to stir up more more problems and more instability, essentially. Um, because people are already anger. Sometimes there's just despair initially when lives are getting harder and tougher, but that despair can very quickly transform into anger that has to be expressed in some kind of format. What is interesting is to think about what the unions are gonna do in response to this. Because for a long time, the unions have had this idea of we just need to get a Labour government in power. Sorry, yeah. And when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party, that was even easier because Jeremy Corbyn was promising lots of wonderful things, which also probably wouldn't have really been able to be implemented. But that's a question for another podcast. But the point is they still, in the main, all backed Starmer. They have their criticisms of him, but they still inadvertently said, well, we need a Labour government. And now this Labour government is going to continue austerity and you're going to have workers who are furious. They want to fight in different forms. This is going to have to be expressed somehow. Um, and we'll have to see what the union leaders do. I mean, I won't hold my breath in terms of them jumping up the barricades and willfully going up for a fight, but they can be dragged into a fight by the pressure from below. Exactly. Um, but that's even just only one way that anger can be expressed. It, you know, strikes and union waves, we had a bit of that a couple of years ago, but there's lots of other ways we could see this anger go. Exactly. I mean, you know, the impact on consciousness is going to be and, and has already been huge. Again, the COVID crisis a few years ago, that was yes. a major turning point in the minds uh, of ordinary people in this country and across the world. The top um, fifth of this country, Britain, own two thirds of the entirety of the wealth. Um, the bottom fifth own 0.5%. Since COVID, the rich has increased its share of the wealth massively. Um, mm. Austerity has increased. Um, inflation uh, has returned and is now a scourge. They're talking a lot in the press about inflation rates going down. That doesn't mean prices are going down. Exactly. It means that the existing increases in prices have already been baked in. That's the new normal. People um, are going to be struggling. They're going to see all of this and they're going to see this government bend over backwards to um, uh, attract oligarchs and CEOs to invest their um, their billions of, of pounds. Uh, they're going to see billions and billions of, of pounds being given to, to Ukraine. To, so, to, yeah. to, I was to, about to say that. Oh, okay. No, I'll, I'll leave it to you. You can maybe go into more detail about that. You know, parts of arms being sold to, uh, to, to Israel, um, all while people are suffering uh, in, in, in this country. And as you said, that anger, um, you know, it's not like it gets channeled into one particular area. It could go to Tommy Robinson. It could go to exactly. Nigel Farage, people like that. It should be going to the labor movement. It should be going to mass protest, strikes, things like that. The leaders of the labor movement should be um, should be leading this struggle against the, the labor government, against uh, austerity, um, against the warmongers and criminals that sort of rule us, but they're not doing that. Yeah. And so in that vacuum, it can go anywhere. Yeah. Um, we saw the riots a few weeks ago. Uh, that was also uh, uh, partly an expression of this uh, this this anger and, and, and discontent. So, yeah, a hundred percent. And I've heard I think I've heard Alan Wood say this um, a couple of years ago now, but it's very apt. What's used a lot. Um, every single thing they do to try and restore the economic equi equilibrium destroys the social equilibrium um and that is austerity but not just austerity austerity in the context of yeah we also need to give billions of pounds to ukraine and continue to make statements i mean in terms of the amount of money that that britain kind of gives to israel it's not the same in terms of scale as like america and the same is true of weapons and so on and so forth but politically the support even that has an impact on consciousness starmer making a statement every single time something happens in in the middle east meanwhile people's lives are getting worse and worse and worse all of this is happening all at once and that's the problem is like they're spinning too many plates um and and as you say i spoke about the unions but there's no guarantee that anger is going to be expressed in that sort of format. Actually, I, I think in the short term, it's much more likely we're going to see mass movements, protests of, on, on a whole host of different issues. But it's that class anger trying to expose itself in a distorted manner and in a warped manner. Because at the end of all of this, the budget, the ins and outs of all the different policies, it's, it's about what you described, this massive 
gap of wealth in society, which is increasing. And 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 Starmer's coming out saying, "Well, this is what we have to do. We've got to we've got to get on with this." Whilst also, you know, his own expenses scandals and the donations of politicians getting all this money, it's just too much all at once. Um, which means it, this is a perfect recipe for for class struggle. Exactly. So what are we what are we going to do about that, Fiona? <laughs> what are we, we do? Well, about it? the first thing we're going to do is is understand what's happening. That's why we do these podcasts. It's why we try and look beneath the surface of what is happening, beneath the surface of what politicians are saying, but also just what society seems to have. Understand that there's a deep rooted class anger and that something needs to channel that. And that's why we're building the Revolutionary Communist Party. That's why we're on a mass recruitment drive at the moment. And that's why actually we have more interest than we ever have done because there is this huge class anger in society. And we're posing an actual alternative to what that is and saying all of this wealth that that exists that we can see could be used in the interests of the working class. And that's obviously what we're fighting for. Um, we do have the Revolution Festival coming up, obviously, where there are some um, great talks specifically on economics, going into specific aspects of Marxist theory, like the labor theory of value, mm-hmm. for example. Also, just the post-war boom. Um, and, and, and trying, to, again, because to understand where we're at now, we do have to go back <laughs> a bit to, to understand that the, these different crises that capitalism has gone through and how that's brought us to where where we are today yep. um but ultimately the most important thing we can do is is, is build the build the rcp um in order to to channel that anger in the right direction because as you say i mean tommy robinson is there he's out there was a i was actually at the demonstration on saturday the counter demonstration i should <laughs> say to tommy robinson thousands and thousands of people um i'm not saying they're they're the people we're aiming at right now uh, or, or ever in some respects but they are there as a distorted expression of class anger. Absolutely. Um, and so we've got a job to do. Yeah. I mean, I, c- I couldn't have said it better myself. You know, people, a lot of people after the riots were quite angry and scared about the prospects for this country. Well, you know, whether things change or not, it's down to us. Yeah. Because we're not big enough to become a reference point for all of this anger and this discontent in society. But we need to become that reference point. And, and the only way we do that is if we grow. Well, thanks very much. I think that's a good place to end it. Thank you for joining me. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed our discussion of the budget. Obviously, we'll see what actually comes out today. Um, but we can promise that it will, you know, be the Tories 2.0 and more austerity, just with a different a different colour or a different name. So yeah, make sure to tune in next week as well. Thank you.